Good morning and welcome to another episode of Beyond Bitcoin. Something special today, of course, is we have the whole team together. Right. And one of them is, of course, right next to me. That's right. We are here in Dubai. <laughs> we're here in Dubai for Token 2049. And we're going to report to everybody next week what happens from Token 2049. But this week, we've got Greg with us. Once a month, Greg, who is the analyst at, at Portal Asset Management, once a month, we're going to be talking about market. We're going to bury ourselves into the volatility of the market, the opportunities in the market, our views of the market. Hello, Greg. How are you? Good morning, Derek. How are you? Good morning, Mitten. Hey, Greg. Good to have you. So the market, let's talk about this ahead. So for the next 20 or 30 minutes, we're going to be discussing the volatility of the market. What's happened? How's it correlated with the existing equities market? What difference is the volatility between these two markets? Obviously, this market is a lot more volatile. Yeah. But month to date, what we've seen, of course, is we've seen Iran send a missile barrage over to uh, Israel. It gave them a good 10 days warning or so. So the markets knew about that along the, along the way. We track the CCI 30, the top cryptocurrencies. And we track that along the way. And when we look at the top cryptocurrencies, that's how we determine it. And at the same time, many people just track Bitcoin. However, the CCI 30, which is a balance between what is about 85% of the capitalization in the market, is currently, as we speak now on the Tuesday, is currently down 20%. So that is a substantial drop. Yet NASDAQ is down, what percentage was NASDAQ I down? think it's about 3% three, three month to date. So we're talking a great deal more volatility in it. And, but there's always, it's an assumption that this is the reason it's down that that is the case. But at the same time, it's tax time in America, isn't it? Is it is tax time. And I, Derek, I've seen so many narratives around this. I've seen geopolitical issues. We've talked about the fact that you have, eco you have economies uh, that are going up and down. Then you have this whole tax season, which always comes up around the same time, because yesterday was April 15th, which is the tax filing deadline. And the, the thinking there is that people need liquidity to pay taxes, and that leads to liquidation. The technical narrative, I think, is around halving. And we've seen a lot of miners now liquidating the Bitcoin to be able to make the investment back into post halving requirements because they need those economies. So there's all these narratives. But Greg, love to hear from you to thread the needle here. I mean, what is what is like how what do we make sense of it? Because every time this goes down, there's this you always attach a narrative that's that's happening to make that a cause for the price movement. What are you thinking around that? Yeah, I think it's really interesting because there's there's so many narratives going on at the same time, as you say. So, I mean, Bitcoin itself only fell, is only down just under 12% month to date. So it's it's still the, considered the premier, the go-to asset within crypto. If you look at Bitcoin dominance, that just went through the roof. So that was telling you that Bitcoin was outperforming all the other altcoins. And that would also suggest or explain, sorry, why Bitcoin has performed better than the CCI 30. So there has been a flight to safety within crypto, but that's a relative flight to safety, isn't it? When you're comparing it to traditional equities or cash or fixed interest. So yeah, the volatility of, of crypto, many have commented that it's a feature, not a bug. We've certainly seen plenty of vol ahead of the halving. That's, that's sort of in line with what's happened in the past halvings, although we haven't seen a fresh all-time high come pre-halving, which we did this time, we obviously haven't been able to sustain that level. Um, but, but a lot of volatility ahead of the Bitcoin halving is quite normal. Um, what you are seeing as well is you're seeing a lot of the um, Bitcoin mining farms in the US actually moving or relocating a lot of their S19 ant miners into other jurisdictions that have cheap electricity. Because at um, around about eight cents US per kilowatt hour, um, those miners are not economic after the upcoming halving, the 3.125 block subsidy um, in, in BTC for, for, for mining each block. So you may actually see um, quite a bit of uh, withdrawal of mining power um, from Bitcoin. You could see a slower block generation. And I think actually you're probably going to see a lot of congestion in the blocks because we've got runes are kicking off right on the block that, that, that the halving occurs. So that's going to create quite a bit of interest and excitement within the big Bitcoin ecosystem. Okay, Greg, stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> 
runes are a fascinating new eventuality of this particular space. And, and I think it's a great opportunity now that the halving is coming to discuss what runes are as part of this and whether you think they'll play a role in liquidity or volatility as the halving goes forward. And the other thing I'd love to ask you is that statement, and we often use it, and that is that volatility is a feature, not a, not a sort of problematic issue in this space. So uh, can you give me your thoughts on those two things? Sure. Okay. So on runes, those of you that have been sort of looking at the Bitcoin ecosystem will be familiar with BRC20s. That was Bitcoin's first attempt at creating tokens on the Bitcoin chain. They tr they had a number of drawbacks though. They're, they're really clunky. They're, they're sort of, they're almost not they're not fun they're not fungible in in, in in some regards because they're sort of injured individually inscribed on 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 individual satoshis uh, they do congest the blockchain and they're quite difficult to sell you actually have to do another inscription onto a brc20 token to be able to sell it it's very complicated and very slow and costly to trade um, runes they've been developed by one of the bitcoin devs casey rodemore um, he's come up with a protocol that he thinks will be quicker, easier, cheaper, uh, and more effective way of creating tokens on Bitcoin. Um, and I think what you're probably going to see is you're going to see a raft of meme coins arrive on Bitcoin. You've seen how, how big and popular meme coins have been on Solana. You've had, you know, popular tokens like Dog With Hat has gone to a US $4 billion valuation. There's been a lot of money made and a lot of money lost in, in meme coins on Solana. Well, I think you'll have very much the same, the same appetite for meme coins on Bitcoin. But look, I think further down the track, it does allow for, for DeFi to come into Bitcoin. You'll see more L2s, Layer 2s coming onto Bitcoin. That'll drive more DeFi opportunities within Bitcoin because, as you know, there are no smart contracts on the Bitcoin chain. There probably never will be, um, but those can get actually um, introduced through, through a Layer 2. So rooms may be the start of that, but I think for the moment, there'll be a raft of projects all trying to be the first project to etch their rune. You, you actually etch a rune, you don't inscribe it. And I think it's going to be chaotic mayhem for the, for, for the first week after the halving with all of these projects coming through. So it can be very expensive to do anything on Bitcoin in, in the next week or so. And then just on that volatility as a feature, it's the volatility that gives you the opportunity to generate returns. That that's really all that comes down to is you know volatility in itself is not a bad thing. It is you know when it's when it when markets going down and it's going down heavily, it does feel bad for your portfolio. But that enables arbitrages, short sellers, those people to to be making money at the same time as well. So yeah, it, it, it's a feature, not a bug. is is a common catch cry. It just says that it, it creates an opportunity in most environments for people to make money because people can make money on volatility. That, that's, as, I guess, as simple an explanation as I can give. Yeah. yeah. So so one thing on this, Greg, Casey Rodemore, he is the one who also uh, came after Ordinals, which is an inscription. And we've spent, there's a whole narrative around Bitcoin ossification, which is the changes. But that aside, let's go back to take a step back into the actual narrative around Bitcoin. So historically, if you look at any of the, you know, the issue we had, turmoil, the global turmoil, whether it's the revolution in Hong Kong, or revolt in Hong Kong for the the ability for China to have the rule ahead of its of its twenty year or, or fifty year expiration of its time or COVID, Bitcoin has always seen an appreciation in value only because of the fact that there's a Bitcoin in, in general, which represents the entire crypto industry, is seen as a sound money concept to say, hey, no one really governs it, and every time there's a calamity or crisis, whether it's economic crisis or a global crisis, Bitcoin has seen its value up. But as Bitcoin as an asset class begin to be more correlated with the risk on assets, we have begun to see that value diminish. And I don't know if it's the, which in, on this podcast, we were pine on this, Derek, where you have stable coins that bring in the liquidity, which also brings in, I would say, infect the Bitcoin ecosystem with the global macro elements, which is supply of money and interest rate that govern these asset classes. What is your perspective on this with ETFs? Because ETF further on, institutionalizes this asset class, which means that you're still treating this as a risk on asset coming into this. Do you think a lot of this correlation begins to be stronger 
as we are institutionalizing you know bitcoin and, and its derivative assets as opposed to the original thesis yeah i think it definitely has because we're saying we're seeing more TradFi or traditional finance investment into Bitcoin in the form of an ETF. So it, it's going to, I think it's it's taken Bitcoin from a store of value, a, an anti-inflationary asset into one that's more of, of a pure investment asset. It's seen as a, it's a new asset class, but it's still just a, a risk on asset class. So as that money comes in to, to Bitcoin. And look, don't forget, it's coming into shares in an ETF. It's not actually coming into, into Bitcoin. Yes, the, the ETF is having to buy that Bitcoin in the market. And we, we, we know what that effect that's had on, that those ETF flows have had on the Bitcoin price and one of the key drivers of why we hit those all-time highs ahead of the halving was from the, the demand from the funds. But once that money's, um, the, that retail money is is invested in the Bitcoin ETF, it, it's, it's held in the brokerage account. And when or if they ever sell it, they're not actually selling the Bitcoin. They'll be selling it to someone else and they'll be pulling that cash out. So I think from that perspective, yeah, the correlation could very much increase with traditional asset classes because when people want to pull their money out in times of uncertainty or, uh, or times of war, then, you know, the, the, the first place they'll probably look at will be that the, the, they're very liquid investments and certainly um, they'll be able to pull a lot of that cash out very easily via their Bitcoin ETF. So definitely think that correlation will will increase again we'd all probably like to see it decrease or continue to to be to break away from traditional asset classes over time that may well occur over time we'll have to wait and see how that how that pans out uh, but certainly in the short term i think definitely there is a an increased correlation with uh, traditional asset classes got it the other thing that of course we're seeing here is is the assumption that ETFs and institutions are going to be diamond-handed investment investors, as the saying goes. They're going to hold strong. That's not necessarily true, of course. You may well see that a lot of the ETF investors are going to be in there for 30 days or in there for 90 days or in there for a week or trading, you know, high, virtually high-frequency trading or equivalents to be able to get some exposure along the way. We don't, as yet, really have insight to how stable the investors are yeah. going to be with ETFs and whether that's going to provide the space with stability or increase its volatility. True. And you know, with Hong Kong <clears throat> recently, and they haven't, the, the, the SEC equivalent of Hong Kong hasn't really come and approved or mm. uh, authorized the approval, but there's a, there's a notion that it's approved in Hong Kong. Mm. So as these different jurisdictions mm. approve their own version of ETFs, there's a demand equation of this entire, you know, ETF coming to, uh, to light. But at the same time, I think that with having a lot of these miners selling their Bitcoin to reinvest in equipment, which is a great thing because they have to now keep up with the, with more, uh, you know, investment into newer hardware that mm. equips themselves to be able to monetize at a, at a different equation of cost structure, with, you know, energy that, that, that Greg mentioned. So I think it'll be interesting to see as to how many ETFs around the world gets approved. What's the demand from ETFs and retail and the supply changes post having, I think that's something which I would like to, yeah. to look at. Yeah, I think. And and of course, we we do get ourselves somewhat immersed in this space. So so, you know, for the listeners out there, of course, this is in there thinking, well, this space is really it's Bitcoin and it's it's altcoins, which is a derogatory term, I think, which just means the alternative <laughs> coins, those that aren't Bitcoin. Right. And that, you know, we're interested in this space is going to go for those that are immersed in the space, for those that are here in the very unusual Dubai that's currently raining and attending Token 2049, we're talking about the establishment of of digital industries at a scale and with technology never seen before in history. We're talking about the establishment of an entire new asset class, not just Bitcoin. And this entire new asset class should, by the way, in due course, no longer correlate with traditional asset classes because it's rapidly growing, rapidly getting funded, rapidly yeah. getting developed. It should disconnect in a positive way in regards to it's, you know, it's capitalization growth and it's growth over that period of time, because it's obviously a new space that's going to see enormous growth. I mean, we often say that the largest number of billionaires made in history is likely to come in Web 3.0. Yeah. And, and if that's the case, then growth capitalization should see a decoupling. So, so one thing on this, right, spot on this and, and one, so I was here on Sunday. 
So I spent some time yesterday in pre-event. So there are 400 events at Token 2049. So it's impossible to go all of them. Yes, you do have a bit of FOMO because you want to be in every every conversation because you want to understand what's going on. But it's practically impossible, and some events are not as great as 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 it, they seem out to be. But one resonating theme, and I went to three events yesterday. One of them was ICP event. One of them was Solana event. One of them was event by one of the capital firms called Shard Capital uh, at the future of at the Museum of the Future, which is this interesting bean structure in in, in Dubai. It's really brilliant. The architecture is amazing, and there's a there's a lot of theme which was interesting because it's Museum, Museum of the Future and there's a conference in the Museum of the Future about the future of what we're looking at, both financial market, but where the industry is heading. Wow. And Greg, uh, one thing was amazing and surprising that a lot of conversation was around liquidity bridging, which is ability for us to be able to move liquidity from Bitcoin ecosystem, which today is like 1.3 trillion, give or take a certain percentage points, to the Ethereum ecosystem hmm. and investing into the various DeFi protocols that are evolving, have evolved and more mature with the Ethereum ecosystem versus the one that are evolving in Bitcoin ecosystem. A lot of projects have talked about moving their assets seamlessly between those two ecosystems. I think that's a sense of maturity. We're no longer talking about scalability, usability, which was a narrative of last year to say, how do we make this more usable? Of course, there's like account abstraction. There's a whole slew of technologies, but the most interesting piece, Greg, was how do we move liquidity between these two live, these two major ecosystems? That to me was refreshing, which is a sign of maturity in my opinion, that we are thinking a bit more at the asset level as opposed to being still stuck in the technical sort of conversations around it. Yeah, that's an interesting, interesting perspective. And I guess the, you're saying that the, 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 the days of the Bitcoin maxis are, are, are numbered. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's you know let's not something that is not great about bitcoin someone complains so they're still there <laughs> <laughs> and let's let's not forget i'm not going to use the word but let's not forget what how bitcoin maxis describe altcoins it's not quite so uh, quite oh. such a generous term so they think that everything other than bitcoin is is not <laughs> worth investing in so i think we're seeing that sort of tribalism perhaps being reduced and, and people are sort of starting to focus on understanding which chains are more useful for certain applications like i mean you know solana for example it's so cheap to transact and so so quick to finalize that it's being you know they've, they've done that have that relationship with visa as, as a payment rail so i think people are beginning to understand now as i said what what chain is is, is each chain, you know, there's not going to be one chain that can do everything is basically is what I'm saying is that uh, and that, that they will have each chain will have its own characteristics that will sort of suit certain kinds of DeFi. But the thing, Greg, is what's interesting about this conversation, at least in the last yesterday, and we actually I must have gone to like at least six different sort of small events, which were the conversation was less about whose chain is better or which chain is more capable. The conversation was about how do we bridge these, the omni chain, the multi chain yeah. conversation. And using, again, the newer age of intent protocols, which is basically your ability to describe intent and let the system figure out how do you resolve those intents and deploy your capital and move the capital seamlessly. And I think once you get to those narratives, no longer you're worried about liquidity fragmentation, worried about tied to a single chain, ability to move the chains. I think that's, a that's a, to me, again, that's why I use the word mature conversations because it's no longer about who's better anymore. It's like, okay, mm. fine. You have an ecosystem, go and build what you want to build as long as we can go in and out easily between the, these two ecosystems. So, so Greg, you are using bridges all the time. Last Wednesday, we were together for an hour and, a, hour and a half or so, and we were just indulging in bridging between different chains. And, and we're doing that because for Greg, who is very active as kind of a, a, a one would affectionately term a D gen in this particular space, you know, you're hunting, you're hunting airdrops in different tokens. They're on different platforms uh, to get there. You're actually bridging between platforms to access the airdrops. Now, for those that aren't really used to this space and a deep dive of that right now, it really is reasonably complicated process. Um, but ultimately it should become a fairly seamless process. Uh, but opportunities exist in between those bridging, um, between the different tokens and different spaces. Uh, and, and you're maximizing those opportunities, so to speak, which is good. So, so for the listeners that are fairly high end in trading in this space, these bridges are giving opportunities to trade yeah. between different sections. Philosophically, 
People have often asked this question, where's the killer application? Where's the chat GPT in all of this? And as I've consistently said, I feel that what's happening is there's an enormous infrastructure that's getting built. Originally layer zeros, then layer ones, you know, and then layer twos, high speed transactions, then DeFi, all getting built so that thousands of, tra- of, of applications can be built on Web 3.0. You have to remember that this isn't a single tech gig. This is an establishment of an entire financial space that is going to operate to a level which is you know, probably driven by AI and certainly automated APIs between everything that will see commerce change in our future, the generation and generation to come. That doesn't happen overnight. And when we make discussions, such as the establishment of bridges between protocols, it's kind of all of this plumbing system that is operating yeah. behind the scenes. And although they might sound a bit techy, each one is a breakthrough to see that this space operates faster and faster and faster, all so that in years to come, we're having conversations about Web3 protocols and about the great new apps that are coming, you know, to be cliched, you know, the, the Facebooks, the Amazons, yeah. et cetera. So coming. to me, this bridging, right, that's a great point you bring, Derek, because I don't just view them as, and, and maybe uh, Greg, the DGen that we know is looking for the airdrops and find wherever he can find his assets and accumulate these assets. But the way I look at this, Greg, the bridging techniques, but there are f- largely four different techniques. It's like an API today in the Web2 world. I use API to handshake with different websites mm. and transfer information, transfer data, mm. which mm. gives instructions to the other website to do yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. I would imagine that this bridging will allow me to be able to avail services across ecosystems. So if I need to use Filecoin that may be in a different ecosystem to use the storage mechanism, I could be in Bitcoin and still be able to do that because bridging mm. allows me to be able to take, val- take advantage of the economic value that I can get for cheap storage or cheap compute or cheap smart contract in a different ecosystem by using my Bitcoin, which actually has some value. So I see this bridging techniques and, and there are, again, we are broadly categorizing bridging as an ability to move value across ecosystem. There are many such sort of options available at our disposal. But the idea is to is actually having a service-based ecosystem that allows us to be able to interact and communicate with each other, just like APIs do that today in a Web2 yeah. web you know, ecosystem. Yeah, well, I, I think I think that's the killer app where you don't know which chain you're on. Yeah. In in reality, where you can seamlessly move from you know Bitcoin layer one to to an Ethereum layer two, or a coin on an Ethereum layer two, without really knowing that you're that you're transitioning. So I, I think I think that's where the future lies. And look, you're right; it, it doesn't happen overnight. I remember you know bridging assets oh, two years ago. It was terrifying. It took over half an hour and you're always concerned that the bridge was going to get hacked halfway through. That's now improved substantially in the last yeah. sort of six months where the the, 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 the number of, of hacks has been reduced significantly. You have a lot more confidence in the code. I'm guessing that it's, it's, a, it's a much better performance in the back end and it, it's happening a lot more quickly. It's, it's, it's almost... It's not quite yet there, but it's almost seamless. It's still quite expensive, but I can see those improvements within the next five years getting to the point where it's pretty much, you know, cost next to nothing and, and takes, you know, point, point 0.4 of a second or whatever it might be. So I think we're getting closer, still a way to go, but um, I, I think that's where the killer app is, as I said, where you, you just don't know. It doesn't matter what chain you're on. Uh, you, you'll seamlessly transition from Bitcoin to ETH to Solana to whatever coin you want to. I still think payments should be the killer use case. The original thinking behind ability to move money and pay for things. And I will say this, that last year about 3.8 billion was one that was lost to technical hacks and vulnerabilities. And yeah. lessons learned, you're right, bridges have improved the hash time, like the smart contract bridging versus asset bridging versus asset communication are some of the vehicles used. And I would say, uh, Greg, that there's been, you said half an hour to move asset, which is painful. How much time did it take for you to do this airdropping? A few minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes? How much time was it for you to be able to do uh, these things? A couple of minutes. A couple of minutes. So it's, this has been conversation so now. 
there's been conversation now, which is again, advancement of account abstraction like technologies or intent protocol like technologies is using investment management platforms. These are the Aladdins and the Alphas of the world. Aladdin is the famous investment management platform from BlackRock is ability for them to have sub second across multiple chains. So if Greg wants to be able to take his Bitcoin liquidity and go to multiple chains and deploy the capital in multiple chains. So I think you're right, Greg, that that's the that's the killer app. That's essentially where we'll go with this. We don't care. We just want the yield. We just want the returns and we have certain risks. To deploy the capital, it's going to go seamlessly across the bridges within the matter of 30 seconds and deploy it in, into microtransaction across multiple chains. That is when I think we reach a sense of maturity. So since we're talking about a little bit of markets here and we're towards the end of our conversation, Greg, CCI 30 index, we said before, down 20%. Some of the alts down a lot more. You know, never investment advice, but from our point, what are we doing with it? We're probably buying extra into this. So, <laughs> so, so do you see this as an opportunity? And are you actively looking at the opportunities of those that are those tokens that we might perceive at this particular time in history are oversold? What are your thoughts? And if so, give us some examples. Um, not an investment advice. Let's not an investment it. advice. Never is. It's about what we're doing. <laughs> not investment advice. But uh, yeah, I think I think you have to look at these sharp pullbacks as opportunities unless you make a decision that there's something fundamentally changed within the geopolitical landscape and 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 you know things are deteriorating rapidly which i'm not sure that we're at that point yet Let, let's wait and see but you know we, we've we've had a number of challenges over the last few years obviously covid like you know, covid19 we had the, the, the russia ukraine war I've had the escalation of what's happening in, in Israel and Gaza and now involving Iran, which is always which is always a fear. So those geopolitical events certainly aren't going to go away. But you know, you can't you can't invest with an assumption that something's going to you know get significantly worse. So there have been opportunities that have certainly have, have come up. You know, there's there's been coins that, that we've been been looking to get into that we probably missed a couple of months ago before before the most recent run that have now come back to a point to such a point where, where they're now looking attractive for us again. And I think Ondo Finance is one that's, you know, fits that real world asset narrative. You know, the, the very good sort of team behind there, behind them and you know the you know a regulated US dollar stable coin with regulated income from a money market fund. I, I think, you know, that might not be that attractive to US investors, but I think if you're an investor in, in Argentina or Lebanon or, or in Nigeria, that kind of asset is actually quite a valuable asset to you. So we've seen quite a bit mm -hmm. of strength in, the, in, in their TVL, the total value locked. They continue to get flow. They've You would have seen recently the Circle, who are the guys behind the USDC um, stablecoin. They've just done a deal with, with BlackRock on the build all token, allowing basically seamless 24 seven transfer between those two assets. So that's really helping, helping Ondo in that regard as well. So that's, you know, that's, that's one of the names that we're looking at. Also we're looking at layer twos on, on Ethereum. You know, I, I did bridge some Bitcoin into ETH last week when when ETH went below that sort of magical 0 0.05 ratio to Bitcoin. And rather than transacting on ETH, I then transferred it into into Arbitrum. And it was an absolute pleasure transacting at two cents versus $25 for gas. So that was certainly certainly very pleasurable. So, so Arbitrum is one of those L2s that we think have, has got still strongly growing total value locked. And, you know, it's obviously benefiting from that Denkun upgrade to Ethereum, as, as have all the other layer twos. So we've, we've just put a little bit more into that in the last little while. And, you know, still very, still very positive on that for the medium to long term. So many of these altcoins, as we're saying, have been, well, one could argue oversold. There's certainly downside volatility and it's been in excess of 20%. So, so it is a logical time. It's always good to hold cash. It's always challenging to hold cash in a portfolio when you want deployment and maximum exposure to the space. But in this space, I think the lesson learned for everybody is that you should hold cash. You should hold some cash back all the time. Yes, it's an anchor to your portfolio for a period of time, but when things like this happen, it gives you the opportunity to deploy into, into, into tokens that have been sold down maybe 30, 40%. 
in a short period of time, which gives some excellent upside. So anyway, an enormous amount that's happened in this industry over the last one week, which is just how we like it, isn't it, Nitin? It's going to be a great <laughs> week here. And yes, it started with, with it's been pouring. And I'm assuming that it, it, it'll continue to pour, not the water, but but ideas and, and, and more information that we that we that we'll get as we go through this token 49. Yeah, indeed. And naturally, we wish we could beam everyone here, but I'll, we'll do our best to attend as many Psy conferences as we can and bring it back to the audience, guys, and try and tell you what happened in this in the space in our meetings. I think one of the great things is we can always give examples, but the vibe, as that old saying goes, how does it feel? What's happening out there? Those are the sort of yeah. things we want to report back you know, to you and say, you know, what do we think the space sector is moving a particular area and what's the vibe in the space? And my gosh, Greg, will be sharing that with you too. Thanks so much for coming along and giving us some views yeah. on the Bitcoin halving, Greg, and, and, and the volatility of the marketplace. See and good luck with your airdrops, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys, and enjoy your time in D Dubai. And I'd love to hear the feedback from it when you come back. Will do. Terrific, everybody. Thanks, we'll guys. see you next week. Ciao. Bye, Bye for now. We hope you enjoyed our weekly conversation. If you have any questions, comments, or suggested topics, please contact Nitin Gower or myself on the emails displayed here or via our LinkedIn profiles. Feel free to subscribe and share with like minded friends. Stay well, inquisitive, and engaged. See you next week.